Exception groups are one of the most unknown and underutilized parts of Python, and in this video, I'm going to show you how they work. They allow you to raise multiple exceptions together in a single group, which is particularly useful when you're running something which can go wrong in a number of ways and you want to communicate that to the user all at once. They were introduced to the standard library in Python 3.11, which included the exception group class and the except star syntax. But they have been around in some form for a little while, for example, Trio's multi-error, which attached a list of exceptions to a single exception. Though obviously that had its challenges when coming to handle these errors, which exception groups aim to solve. They've also been backported to previous versions of Python through the exception group PyPI package. Though obviously in Python 3.10 and lower, you don't have the advantage of the except star syntax. And so it works a little bit differently. I'm not really gonna be talking about it in this video. But if you are interested in exception groups, but you don't have access to 3.11 for whatever reason, that is an option for you. So how do we create and use these exception groups? Let's take a look. We'll start by talking about how to create exception groups, which thankfully is very easy. Uh, and I'm going to do this in a function for reasons that will become apparent later. Uh, so we'll have func and that will return none. And then say we want to have E1, uh, which is a type error. And we could just do like invalid type. E2, which is a value error. Uh, and we could just have this as invalid value. And then E3, I want a good spread of errors just to make it clear um, what's going on here. And then we can create an exception group and we'll call this EG1 for now. And uh, when you create an exception group, you have to give it a message like you would a normal exception. Um, so we're just gonna put some errors uh, occurred. This would likely be something quite generic, like uh, some errors occurred, or maybe if there was a context, like errors occurred in validation of X, for example. And then you have the list of exceptions, which we are just going to pass to E1 and E2 for now. For reasons, again, that will become apparent later. And then we've got to return, no, we're not going to return, we're going to raise EG1. And then we'll come down here and we'll do if name equals uh, main to set up our script. And then we're going to call our func. Now this call will always raise exception group one, so we'll get to see what it looks like. And if we do that, and if I move this up a little bit, we will see exactly what these look like. So I'm using 3.13, so the output is colored, and I'm actually, I'm gonna reduce the size a little bit, uh, just so it all stays on one line. But we start with this exception group trace back, most recent call last, and then you have uh, the function that uh, raise the exception group. And then you have this bit down here, exception group, some errors occurred, so this is our error here. And then we have two sub exceptions, so it actually tells you how many exceptions there were. And then you have the one and two, and you have our type error, and we have our value error here with invalid type and invalid value. Now you don't get the full trace back on every error in here. Each of them are an exception object that do have the trace backs, but they're not displayed by default. The way you would actually need to display them is by uh, going into the exception group and then actually uh, printing out each exception individually. But we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about how to actually handle them. But before we do that, I want to show you that you can actually nest exception groups if you want. So we can come back up here and do eg2 equals exception group, um, and we'll say some nested errors uh, occurred like that. And then we can pass our original exception group, which of course is just an exception. And then we can pass in e3 uh, as well here. And now if we run this, uh, and if we actually save, or if we actually return the right exception group, that would help. We now get a nested exception group. So we have some nested error occurs to exception groups. So EG2 was the one that's raised. EG2 contains EG1, so that will be printed in its entirety here. And then we have our second error in this exception group, which is E3, which is our name error, which gets printed down here. And I just did invalid, I didn't do invalid name for some reason. There we go. Now I am personally of the mind that nested exception groups start looking a bit messy, um, especially when you're not using Python 3.13 and you don't have the colors. The original video I did on exception groups was in 3.11 just after it came out. So that didn't have the colors and everything looks quite a bit messier in that version. But you can of course nest exception groups to your heart's content. So you can have three, four, five levels. There might be a maximum. I don't know what it is if there is one, uh, but I imagine it would be reasonably high, something you would never realistically ever need. 
So those are the basics of actually creating exception groups. As I said, there's not really an awful lot to it. Most of the difficulty, if you want to call it that, um, comes in actually handling them because it involves a new syntax called accept star. You can handle them using a normal accept. Um, so you could do something like try uh, func and then accept uh, exception group as uh, eg and then do stuff with it and i'm not going to do anything in the code i'm just going to show you the pep that this was uh defined in so pep 654 specifically the bit talking about uh, handling exception groups now this talks about how you would go about um, checking and printing out the individual exceptions and it's quite a lot of work to go into this so you have this leaf generator as an example um, which takes, uh, let's see down here, it enumerates over the uh, the leaf generator of the exception group. And it basically recursively goes through each exception group. And if the exception is an exception group, then it recurses in one level deep and then starts yielding from itself with the exception. If it's a normal exception, it will just yield the exception object itself. And then you can get the outputs down here and you see that it does actually maintain um, at least some of the trace back. I think it actually does. Yeah, I think it's just the way. Oh, I think because this is in the shell, the uh, the trace back looks a bit weird. But you can actually, if you want to do that, uh, get the the full trace backs back out this way. However, you most likely wouldn't want to do this because it's a lot of additional effort. And there is a simpler way to do that. And as I said, that is the accept star syntax. So we are going to come back to our thing here. We're going to get rid of all this. And you'll notice that we have our type error, our value error, and our name error here. If you want to just catch name errors, we could do accept star name error as exc, and then we could just like print our oh node name error caught for the time being, like that. And now, if we try to run this again, we'll notice that the name error is not actually included in our exception because we've handled it. Um, and then the remaining uh, errors within the exception groups still get propagated. So we have this name error caught here and all of our unhandled exceptions still get raised to the top level. So it cleans it up a little bit, but the other errors are still here. We can of course then uh, catch our uh, accept star type error and value error. So this is an example of how you can still catch multiple types of exceptions in the same uh, thing. And actually we're going to call this E2 and this E1 for reasons that have become clear. That seems to be uh, a pattern with this video, to be honest. Uh, type or value error, yeah, uh, caught like that. And then you have name error caught and then type or value error caught. You might think that this E1 represents an individual exception and you would actually be wrong. So if I were to redo this as an F string and say, I want to print E1 uh, like that, uh, we can see that it is actually an exception group with our name error included. And that's because the accept star doesn't get errors out of exception groups, it instead splits the exception groups by what's been caught and what hasn't. So E1 here is what has been caught and then everything else that gets past this is what remains. And this might seem weird and uh, at a glance, especially in this example, but let's say we had two name errors. Let's say we had E4 here and then we had name error that was invalid name two and then we passed E4 to this. Now we do this accept star and you might think we catch a name error and then you think which one? And the answer is both because it catches the exception group with both name errors present. And then you can iterate through the exception group as much as you want and you can get the errors out and you could do all your fancy stuff with them if you want to. Uh, but this catches all the name errors uh, within the uh, within the exception group. And I forgot to mention actually when talking about the type error and the value error down here, the accept star statement um, checks recursively through all the exception groups. So our type error and our value error are within the exception group one, which is in uh, exception group two, but we didn't have to do any weird um, 
checking to to check through different exception groups. The accept started it for us. And we can actually get proof of that if we mirror what we've got up there. So if you do E2 equals, and this is, uh, for people that haven't seen this because I get comments every time I use it, uh, this is a nice little debugging thing that basically prints E2 space equals space and then the value of E2 in the format string. And then you can also use the uh, the string representation or the formalized string representation by using colon R. I'm going to do a video about this um, at some point. I did a video about F string format specifications recently, but I left the expression components alone. Uh, but going back to exception groups, if you look at E2, we have the exception group. And then because this type error and this value error are within exception group one, we get this exception group and then we have, oh sorry, this exception group is in this exception group. So it doesn't bring them up to the top level of exception groups, meaning if you do want to look through the type error and the value error specifically, then you do still have to recursively go through them yourself, which is a bit irritating, um, but I'm not 100% sure how else they could realistically have done that, maybe besides giving you just a list. Maybe the exception groups wouldn't have been super important. I don't know. But either way, that is how you can use accept star to start filtering out errors and start catching errors um, and doing things. Like largely, you probably wouldn't need to access the error directly. You would just need to check if an error actually happened and then perform some sort of function, whether you wanted to log it or if you wanted to like close a connection to something with an error without actually really caring what the error was, then that's what you can do. It's only really when you need the the specifics, say if you had like some sort of request error that had the error code as an attribute of that error, you might run into problems actually trying to access that. If there is something in the standard library that does facilitate making that easier, then do let me know in the comments. I'm not aware of one, the pep doesn't mention one, uh, but there might be one that I just missed when researching this. So the reason I'm talking about exception groups today is because I have recently been messing around with them for my project analytics. Now I've brought this up a number of times on the channel, so long time viewers will be familiar with it. Uh, but for those that aren't aware of it, very briefly, it's a wrapper around the YouTube Analytics API and it provides a validation layer to requests that the YouTube Analytics API doesn't have. So if you make an invalid request to that API, it will just tell you, lol, it was bad, try again. It won't actually tell you what was wrong. Analytics goes through and then actually validates and tells you what's wrong with the thing. So it's basically just a validation library really. And exception groups are really good in that sort of context because at the moment, uh, analytics will see an error and it will raise that error immediately without going through. And if there are multiple errors with requests, you need to try again, you know, running the script or whatever it might be multiple times before you get one that's successful. Each one uh, throwing up a different error. But with exception groups, you can actually save these errors as they come up and then uh, show them to the user at the same time. And this is an example on this window about how all this works. This is still very early development. It's not hooked up to anything at the moment. Um, so it's very early work. So do kind of excuse that. You can tell by the fact that um, if I go into fields, there's just a point where it stops becoming implemented. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about what any of this does, but all you need to know is that at some point further up, um, analytics will create an instance of this report type class, and then it will call this validate method on it. And then it creates this error list, uh, talking about self.dimensions.validate, filters.validate, metrics.validate, and then this.validate. Uh, this self.dimensions is an instance of this class here and self.dimensions.validate is this function here. And it itself creates an errors list and then starts uh, appending errors where it finds problems. So data.alldimensions is a set of all the dimensions that are valid in this API. And a dimension is just like a field or something. It's not really important exactly what it is. But if you've provided something that isn't a valid dimension and it will append this error to the errors and it will do so uh, for this as well. And then it uh, goes actually one level further by talking about constraints. These are these here. So you have these validate functions here that just return, well, they return, um, that's actually not supposed to return a list. 
<laughs> let me change that it returned a list at one point in time it's not supposed to anymore um, but it just returns an error in itself if it fails and then these all get appended or extended and then errors are returned out of here they then return back up here and they form this list here there's an even more checks going on here and then if there are any errors at the end of all that so if the list is populated then it creates a message saying just validation failed for self.name report and then it raises an exception group with this message and with all the errors that were raised and as an aside you may notice uh, this up here this is because i do want to support python 3.10 with analytics um so 3.10 doesn't have exception groups they were introduced in 3.11 so if we're running 3.10 and just raise the first error you see just to vault back to the, the the old behavior i might come up with a better way of doing that um, i'm fully aware that you could just raise a single exception and have like a bullet pointed list of all the problems so i could do that maybe but that seems a bit inconsistent if i'm doing exception groups elsewhere um, so we'll see again this isn't necessarily the final version and because it's not the final version, because it's not really hooked up, I can't give you a live demonstration, but I have prepared this script, which kind of mocks things up. So it just has this list of errors and then an exception group. And then if I do, it'd be analytics slash report six, which is my temporary directory for this. And then this script here. And this is roughly what it will look like once everything is done. So we'll have validation fail for time-based activity report four sub exceptions and then each of these is a separate thing. Um, these are all the same exception class at the moment. I'm thinking about maybe changing. So you have like dimensions, not valid, filters, not valid, things like that. Um, but again, this is all quite early in development. But I wanted to show this off as the real world example. I guess real world is not in the real world yet. Um, but the real world example of how exception groups could be used this is what i've been using them for and i do like to include real world examples in videos because it just makes them make a bit more sense it it contextualizes these systems uh more than i would do if it was just illustrative examples but yeah let me know what you think about exception groups in the comments below yeah, let me know how uh, what you think of this implementation so far if you want an analytics if there are any optimizations you can come up with i'll be I'll be glad to know because i haven't really messed with exception groups much before this um so learning from people that know would be really nice if you have any information if you like the video at any point then consider leaving a like to let me know and maybe subscribe if you want to see more videos like this and if you have any questions or concerns then also feel free to leave a comment in the in the almost said the description below in the comment section below as well and i'll answer them uh, if i can if you want to see all the other ways that Python is awesome, then consider watching my Python is awesome series that is linked on the end cards right now. And I'll see you in the next video for whatever we do next.